All right, so good morning. Um, today's Tuesday, May the 19th, and today we're gonna do some hiring best practices. So let's get started. So the agenda for today is, um, we're gonna talk about some hiring tools, physical abilities testing, integrity testing, uh, six common hiring mistakes. Um, we're gonna talk quickly about DOT and uh, fleet drivers, company vehicle drivers, uh, some incentives, and then we'll wrap it up. So physical abilities testing, um, making the case for it. So traditional approaches to managing these um, injury risks include you know, addressing workplace hazards, improving case and claim management, safety and injury prevention uh, training, developing return to work programs, um, also investigating fraudulent cases. So these are all great things that we should definitely be doing but when you're looking at new employees, what we fail um, to consider is that hiring is a significant part of our injury uh, prevention program. So we wanna only hire those who have uh, proven themselves capable of meeting the physical demands of the job. So some benefits of physical ability testing. So it can identify persons who have pre-existing conditions or disorders. Um, because you're, we're not allowed to ask if somebody's had a work comp claim um, during the hiring process, but when you do a physical abilities testing, they can find these things out. Uh, identifies persons who are not, um, who do not meet essential job specific requirements. It also will collect some baseline measurements. So it allows comparison of employees pre-injury and their post-injury status. So when you know, um, the condition that somebody is when they started working and they have an injury six months later, you're able to compare where they were um, and where they're at when they have their injury and then once they have rehabbed that injury. It also qualifies um, employees' legitimate injuries and also can help disqualify fraudulent injuries. So what is a physical abilities test? It's known as a functional capacity exam, a work capacity evaluation, uh, but they're all kind of the same thing and it's used to determine an, an individual's ability to safely perform work related physical demands and meet positional uh, tolerance demands. So it's a systematic process of measuring and developing an individual's capacity to dependably sustain performance in response to broadly defined work demands. So what is measure? An applicant will typically begin with a medical history evaluation. Um, then they will be they will go through a um, they'll they'll look at their you know their total body makeup. Um, they're looking at their um, you know do they have any issues that are easily um, identified during this process. Once that's done, um, they will start to undergo a series of functional tasks based on the job requirements. So. Um, some of these can be material handling, lifting, carrying, pulling or pushing, uh, performing physical tasks, so stooping, crouching, reaching and climbing. So with the, you know, the materials handling, if you are requiring somebody to carry 80 pound bags of cement, uh, you know, throughout the day, you need to make sure that they can carry that and they're able to carry it. They may appear that they can carry it just by looking at them, but there may be some underlying issues that can come up and we'll show you that they really cannot carry those things. During the testing, uh, the heart rate is monitored. So that's one, one reason is for safety during the test, but it's also included in the scoring of the test. If we have extremely high elevated heart rate throughout the testing, uh, that can also signal some underlying issues. And, you, and these tests usually take uh, anywhere between 30 and 45 minutes. So if you are going to introduce a um, PAT screening program, what should it look like and what should it include? So you wanna target jobs creating most of the risk. So not all jobs that you're hiring for will require a PAT, but the ones that have, you know, where employees are lifting the heaviest things throughout the day. You wanna make sure that those are the jobs that you are having the testing being done for. Um, you wanna conduct a quantitative job analysis. So you wanna ID essential physical requirements of each job that a PAT will be used for. Develop a job specific test. So you wanna use the info, the information from your 
job analysis for testing and IDing minimal requirements for passing. So if somebody is required to you know, carry 30 pound boxes, you need to make sure that the um, that they are able to pass that requirement. If they're only able to carry 25 pound boxes, um, they're probably not fit for that job of carrying just the five more. You also want to only use qualified evaluators. So uh, physical and occupational therapists, athletic trainers, exercise psychologists, or physiologists and kinesiologists can be trained to perform these tests. And typically you're going to go to a company that does these testing where they have the qualified evaluators. And you also, once you um, have your program together, you want to measure your return on investment. So um, you want to track your work-related injury costs before and then after initiating the program so you can, you know, provide the justification for either continuing it or discontinuing it or even expanding it to other jobs that you weren't testing before because you may find that you are hiring the right people that are qualified and you just want to expand that out throughout your company to some different jobs. All right, so things to avoid when developing and implementing uh, physical abilities testing. You want to avoid pre-offer testing. So the functional screen is best performed after a conditional offer is made. One of the reasons is um, you don't want to be sending every applicant out for these tests because they can get pricey. Um, so you want to make sure that you've made the offer uh, and before this employee starts the job, then you send them out for the testing. Avoid general strength and machine-based testing. So. Um, using generic strength tests such as push-ups, sit-ups, um, aerobic step tests, these, these are not going to be activities that they, they may show that somebody is in shape, but they're not activities that are closely related to what that job is actually doing. Avoid uh, percentile metrics. So if an applicant, you want to ignore, you know, if the applicant is in the fifth percentile or the 95th percentile, what really matters is whether the applicant's abilities match the demands of the job. So we're going to talk about some other uh, pre-employment testing types. Um, we have reactive, which is criminal, background checks, uh, drug tests, credit checks, and then we have our proactive te testing, which is integrity testing, and there's you know, also personality testing. So um, criminal background, they may be required for certain contracts or certain jobs wherever you're working. Sometimes drug tests are required, um, not always required. I think it's good to have drug tests. Credit checks, uh, more of a, you know, a white collar job. So we'll, we're going to talk about some of the pros and cons of each type of testing here. So background checks, um, they are, they can give you some complete and verifiable information when it is available. Um, it also may increase the truthfulness of applicants. So if they know that you're doing a background check, they may um, tell you if you know, they do have a criminal record. They may have something that, that pops up when that background check is done. Um, some of the cons of this, it only detects individuals have, have committed crimes and have been caught. So there might be a lot of individuals out there that have you know, they've committed crimes, but they just were never caught. Um, it does not represent a candidate's current state of mind. So if you are looking at a criminal record and it might be something from 10 years ago, um, they may have completely rehabilitated and they may have a completely different outlook on you know, moving forward. Also, these can be expensive depending on the service and the company you're using. Uh, personality testing. So these are definitely good and useful predictors of job-related behaviors, such as you know the service, how they work in a team, if they are being considered for a leadership position, will it you know will they fall into that leadership role, um, and it, it, will it work out? It does require some extensive training for managers to uh, interpret the results accurately. Um, it does not identify job candidates with high-risk behavior potential. And these tests are uh, more expensive than background checks, uh, but they are good for when you're looking at leadership roles, um, you know, supervisor types, but they can get pricey. Integrity testing. Um, integrity tests will identify high risk um, behavior candidates. So candidates that are um, actively involved in risky behaviors, it will identify those. 
integrity testing does not detect job related skills such as the teamwork, service, and leadership. So, integrity testing, how does it work? Integ integrity testing should be administered pre interview. Um, so, this will avoid managers uh, wasting their time on non serious, high risk applicants. So, these are done very quickly. Um, and it uses a cognitive dis, um, dissonance to obtain answers taken by the test takers. So the human behavior is um, when individual, individuals who are involved with risky behaviors like theft or illegal drug use will gradually begin to rationalize their behavior as normal. So the results with them having no issues with answering direct questions about their current or recent abnormal risky behavior. So the four main problems that integrity testing will address, it, it addresses employee theft, drug and alcohol abuse in the workplace, um, faking things, being dishonest, violence, and bullying. So the first problem is theft. 25 to 40 percent of all employees steal for their employers. Uh, this may be on a large scale or it could be on a small scale, but typically um, whenever somebody is accustomed to stealing from their from the employer, uh, they will continue that behavior from job to job. Um, employee theft costs employers over $50 billion on an annual basis, and 55% 50, of theft perpetrators are in a management position. So the second problem is uh, drug and alcohol abuse in the workplace. So drug and alcohol related abuse by employees totals 100 billion a year. That's a lot of money. Um, these you know, drug and alcohol abusers use three times as many sick days, are four times more likely to be in an incident or, or accident, and five times more likely to file for workers' compensation. Um, nearly 75% of, of adult illicit drug users are employed, as are most binge and heavy alcohol users, representing 15% of the workforce. So these people are employed. Uh, sometimes the signs are very, very obvious, but a lot of times they're not, they're not obvious because you know, it's, it's a little bit easier to detect alcohol use because of the smell, but when somebody is addicted to opioids, um, you know, they, there's not a smell. They um, are basically like a functioning alcoholic. There's just not the telltale signs of that. Um, and drug and alcohol abusers are also 10 times more likely to steal from their employers. The third problem of the integrity testing addresses is faking and dishonesty. So 50% of all resumes or applications contain outright lies. Um, the National Insurance Crime Bureau estimates that workers' compensation fraud accounts for 25% of all insurance fraud or $7.2 $7 billion annually. The last issue that integrity testing addresses is violence and bullying. So there are over 2 million cases of workplace violence per year. Um, workplace violence costs 121 billion with non-fatal assaults costing 876,000 lost workdays. Uh, workplace violence has accounted for over 5,000 fatalities over the last seven years and Roughly 35% of workers say they have felt bullied at work. Um, this can lead to a, a lot of different issues um, in your workplace. It can lead to you know, people leaving, people quitting, not showing up for work, um, not being able to do their job correctly. So this is a good problem that the integrity testing will address. So some of the benefits of integrity testing, it increases productivity, it's very low cost, um, it's the results are instant, basically, I mean, usually, depending on the company that you're using for it, um, the, the results are either going to be a pass or fail. Is this person um, more likely to lie, cheat, or steal, or are they an honest, honest person? It reduces turnover, reduces empl um, employment theft. It reduces frictional costs, such as legal, rehab, and TPA costs. Um, it reduces um, FMLA short-term disability, long-term disability, and having to increase your sick leave programs or even sick day programs. It reduces unemployment insurance expenses. Uh, it can reduce workers' compensation loss rates, and it reduces background screening and drug testing costs. 
this is a long list of the benefits, um, some more benefits of integrity testing. I've highlighted a couple here, uh, the instant results, uh, it will accelerate the hiring process. Um, it will reduce absenteeism. It can also improve your auto liability expenses. It will identify applicants with the entitlement mentality. Um, it, there also could possibly be a reduction in non-occupational disability losses. All right, so next we're gonna move on to five um, hiring mistakes, common hiring mistakes to avoid. These are checking references, not embracing technology, um, hiring skills instead of character, um, not providing training, and being afraid of losing employees. So the first one is not checking or even asking for reference. So to avoid this, you want to um, ask them for the refer reference and then make the calls. So it seems simple, but employers don't take the time to make the calls that can help them either screen out or screen in workers. So you're, you, a lot of times, who is gonna give a bad reference? But you may be surprised that um, somebody does give a bad reference or they don't know that that reference is gonna be bad for them. Um, just like you might learn a reason to reject a person when you're making these reference checks, you might find out that a fringe candidate has more potential than you originally saw if you can hear some true stories or some actual things that have happened from a reference that they've provided. All right, mistake number two, um, not embracing technology. So how do we avoid this? Uh, you need to upgrade your, te upgrade your technology. So field workers, supervisors, salespeople and managers are getting younger. Technology is, it just becomes more important to them. Um, and also, if you're not embracing technology, you're ignoring any improvements that technology can actually provide you. So millennia, millennials don't look at construction naturally because they're very, um, they're good with the computers, they feel comfortable working with technology, they're good with phones, iPads, um, you know, apps and all these different things. So contractors who have embraced technology, they do have an advantage in hiring and retaining good workers, especially in that millennial category. So number three, um, hiring skills instead of character. Paying closer attention to a prospect's personality and character um, than the skills he possesses when possible is how you try to avoid this. Now, this doesn't apply for every single job, but usually uh, if somebody has potential, they have good character, they could be trained for the job. So it is you cannot really build um, character traits or develop character traits if somebody doesn't have them, but if they do have a good character, you can build skills around that character. Number four is don't provide training. So to avoid this, you need to train your new, new employees to your company standards. So how many people do you know who don't want to do a good job? And how, how many do you know who don't want to learn a new skill? In theory, you've hired the right people, so you wanna make sure to provide them a chance to learn, grow, and develop so they can help your company do the same. Not only will, you, will your work quality improve, um, but so will efficiency on the job, and quite possibly, you'll have fewer equipment issues and less injuries um, if somebody knows exactly how to do something with that equipment um, and they're doing it in a safe, uh, a safe manner. So, um, training, we're gonna continue this a little bit. Um, not training new workers is a, one of the biggest mistakes that contractors make once that new employee is hired. Um, most of the time, employers have good intentions, but you're so busy um, that you stick the new employee with the crew and tell them to watch what the crew does and try to keep up with them. Um, that's not always the worst thing to do, but day one, it might not be the best thing because you have the, the new employee will be stuck probably doing things that they didn't think they were hired for. Um, and they'll, they'll just kind of get shoved off to the side and they're not actually learning the way they need to do stuff within your company. So you wanna make sure you take the time to train new employees to set them up for success. And the last one, number five, is being afraid of losing employees. So to, you've gotta change your mindset. A common excuse for no So change your mindset. Um, a common excuse for not training people. 
I'm sorry, there's some things popping up on my uh, screen. As soon as I've trained them, they'll go to a competitor. competitor. In the big picture, if you train them well, you raise the job quality bar for the whole company. Um, but more important, why would you leave after you've invested training efforts in them? So odds are that there's something you're doing or not doing that gave them a reason to leave. So examine your operation to try to identify what that is. Are you paying um, market wages? Are you providing enough hours? Are you forcing employees to work too many hours? With millennial, millennials, this, this is a concern, but um, it's something that you should look at. Are your new employees being ignored? And is your work environment unsafe? Whatever the reason is, few people will take your training and bolt to the competition without a reason. So if you can identify uh, the reasons why people, you know, you're afraid that people are leaving, you can probably fix that. So we'll do one slide on hiring drivers. So we not, all know the process for hiring a CDL driver, but what about non-CDL drivers being hired and will driving and driving a company vehicle. So although we're not required to maintain a you know, quote driver file for fleet drivers, best practices, practices suggest maintaining the following. Um, pulling and um, keeping an annual NBR, keeping their driver's license on file, requiring your drivers of a company vehicle to have a minimum um, number of years of driving experience, Doing an annual review, so if there's stuff that's showing up on their MVR, you want to review this with that driver, and also require your drivers to go through some defensive driver training. Last, um, promote and reward recruiting. So make recruiting a top priority for everyone. Consider offering a signing bonus to new employees and a referral bonus to existing employees who recommend someone you end up hiring. So this can be paid in increments to make sure that the new employees work out. Also offer employee referral incentives, incentives to subcontractors or suppliers who may give you a good employee referral as well. All right, so to wrap it up, um, there are many hiring tools that, that can help uh, with screening potential employees. Just remember these tools are not one size fit all in most cases. Um, integrity testing is probably good for everyone. Uh, but, all, but your functional capacity valuations, they might, they might not be good for every job category you have. Probably the more intense um, and you know, heavy lifting jobs, those are definitely something you should look at for those. Um, don't hire your next workers comp claim. Ensure your candidates are fit for the job and every task that is required. So you can't ask for um, if an employee, if a potential employee has had a work comp claim, so you want to find out if they're physically fit to do that job because if they re-injure themselves doing something for you that they were unable to do, that work comp claim is now going to go onto your experience mod. All right, so if you're struggling with retaining the good workers, evaluate why. The first 30 days is crucial to make sure that that employee is engaged, they've been trained properly, um, and they're given some direction for what to do. Um, are you taking the time to train them properly? And are new hires ignored? Or are you giving them meaningful tasks um, or just throwing them in with the crew and telling them to watch? And I'll last, reward successful references made by employees. So typically good employees will have friends or no other good employees. Take those references and ensure you're getting references from your current employees because you want to always be hiring, um, even when you're, you don't have an open position, because good employees are hard to come by. So when a good one comes up, you want to make sure that you're ready to get them, um, onboard them, and get them trained so they can uh, provide some value to your company. So I'm Michael Williams, and that's our presentation for today. So do we have any, um, do we have any questions? out there. I'll go ahead and unmute everybody. Okay, um, if we don't have any questions, if you have any questions, you can reach out to, to me, your producer. Uh, we can get you some more information on this, some different companies that we recommend for your integrity testing or the functional capacity evaluations um, and any other, um, you know, hiring best practices that we can help you out with. Thank you all very much. Thank you.